Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We have reached the fourth chapter, The Systems of Yoga, and we are on the 21st episode. In the last episode, Sri Aurobindo was covering a brief overview of Hatha Yoga, where he showed us the framework of Hatha Yoga where it uses the gross body, the Stula Sharira, with its material and vital frame. And it tried to master and perfect these layers. And that will become the point of contact for contact with the divine consciousness. So in that, it uses asanas, pranayamas and related kriyas. But the limitation of Hatha Yoga is that it occupies all your time, especially if you want to really go beyond the average utilization, average use of normal health, and to change the very equilibrium of life energy in the bodily frame so that it can open to universal energy and open to much more powerful action. In order to do that, Hatha Yogin will have to spend their whole life practicing their asanas, kriyas, and related practices to accomplish it. In the process, what happens is you lose contact with the life because you don't have time for it. So as a result, at the end, you have accomplished physical siddhis, but very little purpose for the collective life because you have isolated yourself from the collective life. That's what happens if you go deep into accomplishing the physical siddhis according to the Hatha Yogic methods. So he doesn't see much purpose in that because it's not practical, not applicable in a society. Now, Sri Aurobindo's goal is the eventual transformation of the human nature at a large collective level. So then he is coming to now, next, Raja Yoga. He's going through different systems one by one. So we finished Hatha Yoga. Now we are into Raja Yoga. We are on the paragraph number 11. And uh, you can find the link in the description. Please follow the text so that we can enjoy the journey together. Raja Yoga takes a higher flight compared to the Hatha Yoga, it takes a higher flight. It aims at the liberation and perfection, not of the bodily, but of the mental being. Remember, the bodily life is part of the gross body, the sthula sharira. Raja Yoga is using the mental being, which is the part of a subtle body, sukshma sharira. So Hatha Yoga focus on the gross body. Raja Yoga looks at the subtle body. It aims at liberation and perfection, not of the bodily, but of the mental being. The control of the emotional and sensational life, the mastery of the whole apparatus of thought and consciousness. So that's what the mental being is involved with. There is emotional and sensational life. And there is thought and all the related operations. All these are to be mastered. So there is the control of the emotional and sensational life, the mastery of the whole apparatus of thought and consciousness, that self-aware part. It fixes its eyes on the chitta, that stuff of mental consciousness, in which all these activities arise. Chitta, word well known in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra where it starts with this line, Atha Yoga Anushasanam, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. So that is the ref reference here. 
it fixes its eyes on chitta and chitta is the stuff of mental consciousness in which all these activities the chitta activities of the chitta arises all the attractions repulsions liking disliking and related thoughts imaginations the whole flux that is happening all that activities arise in the chitta and it seeks even as hatha yoga with its physical material first to purify and tranquilize we have seen that in hatha yoga you have to cure the body of its restlessness the nerves of its restlessness and bring the stillness and peace into them that is a condition for hatha yoga the same way even if hatha yoga is doing it at the gross body level raja yoga does it at the subtle body level where it has to first purify and tranquilize this is the foundational work purification and bringing tranquility it fixes its eyes on the chitta the stuff of mental consciousness in which all these activities arise and it seeks even as hatha yoga with its physical material first to purify and tranquilize the normal state of man is a condition of trouble and disorder a kingdom either at war with itself or badly governed for the lord the purusha is subjected to his ministers the faculties subjected even to his subjects the instruments of sensation emotion action and enjoyment a beautiful picture there is there are these three layers there is this king who is the purusha the soul within then there are ministers of the soul who are these ministers our intellect our buddhi intelligent will or our emotional being all these are ministers even our physical instrumentation these are all ministers of the soul instruments through which the soul acts that's the second layer not only the king the soul is subjected to this instrument these main ministers the soul is also subjected to the subjects who are the subjects then there are this instruments of sensation we have all our five senses engage with the world outside and caught up in the world outside with its sensations with its liking with its disliking with its attractions all that is where it is bound so the soul sitting inside is supposed to be the master but is not the master it is subjected to these ministers and the subjects themselves so as a result the normal state of man is a condition of trouble and disorder a kingdom either at war with itself or badly governed because the king is not able to govern so what happens even ministers are not able to govern a minister says so your intelligence is telling you look this food is not good for you or anger is harming you okay you understood there is a policy made at the government level anger is not good for every anyone abolish everyone should eat healthy you can have policy documents but nothing much changes unless subjects the people changes so what happens when we have awareness we have knowledge this should not be done your minister is saying the mind intelligent mind is saying don't do this but senses are telling i want this ice cream now i want that chocolate now and you get subjected to it the craving pulls you into it or you may say that no i anger is not good for me i should not be getting angry i should resolve this bad habit but life situations come you burst into anger there is no control over it so external life contacts someone or other out there something or other out there makes you angry and you're subjected to it and inside the king is sitting but without any power to govern the kingdom so it's very badly governed 
As a result, we go through our emotional ups and downs, our angers, our depressions, our illness, our all kinds of troubles. So a condition of trouble and disorder, a kingdom either at war with itself or badly governed. For the Lord, the Purusha, is subjected to his ministers, the faculties. Ministers are referred to as the faculties. Subjected to even to his subjects, the instruments of sensation, emotion, action and enjoyment. Even the enjoyment become a trap. You get addicted to things and so you get subjected to things. First, therefore, the powers of order must be helped to overcome the powers of disorder. So there is a power of disorder, forces that brings disorder into the kingdom, and then there are forces that brings order. So the forces that can bring order must overcome the forces of disorder. For the, therefore, the powers of order must be helped to overcome the powers of disorder. The preliminary movement of Raja Yoga is a careful self-discipline by which good habits of the mind are substituted for the lawless movements that indulge the lower nervous being. So that's what the purification stage is. Yama, Niyama. These are the practices according to Raja Yoga manuals where you bring in purification of these instruments that are otherwise subjected to all the compuls all these cravings and compulsions and addictions and that has to be overcome. So the preliminary movement of Raja Yoga is the careful self-discipline by which good habits of mind are substituted for the are substituted for the lawless movements that indulge the lower nervous being. So there is a lower nature which is the nervous being. Our senses craving for things all the time, our impulses, our compulsive impulses and biological drives, all that are driving compulsively and we get bound by it, these are to be replaced by good habits of intelligent will and mind. And that is the first condition. And this purification enables us to take the next step. Otherwise, what happens is when we intensify the energy without purification, all the impurities gets amplified. So you get into bigger trouble if you have attempted to intensify your energies before purifying your inner nature. So it is a safety requirement to purify first. So the preliminary movement of Raja Yoga is a careful self-discipline by which good habits of mind are substituted for the lawless movement that indulge the lower nervous being. By the practice of truth, by renunciation of all forms of egoistic seeking, by abstention from injury to others, by purity, by constant meditation and inclination to the divine Purusha, who is the true Lord of the mental kingdom, a pure, glad, clear state of mind and heart is established. So the various aspects of that purification leading towards that inner tranquility is described here. The practice of truth, the habit of indulging in falsehood, in lies, even if it is exaggerations or understatements, all that leads to degeneration of loss of truth. So therefore, the practice of truth, satyam, by renunciation of all forms of egoistic seeking, our activities in the world largely are self-centered. It's for me, my accumulation, my success, my victory. 
that is the egoistic seeking that has to be overcome for the larger good for the divine so that is the renunciation of all forms of egoistic seeking having to we have to renounce this ego and its ego centered seeking by abstention from injury to others of course not harming others in any way in thought in speech in action not harming anyone sarve bhavantu sukhinah let everyone be happy by purity by constant meditation and inclination to the divine purusha so meditation and inclination to the divine purusha the divinity seated within or whatever be the way you have conceived the divine conceiving that and inclining towards that continuously through continuous meditation on that who is the true lord of the mental kingdom the master of the mental kingdom a pure glad clear state of mind and heart is established it is by this purification a pure glad clear state of mind and heart is established this is the first step only afterwards the ordinary activities of the mind and sense must be entirely quieted in order that the soul may be free to ascend to higher states of consciousness and acquire the foundation for a perfect freedom and self mastery so first step is this purification and establishing the inner quietude gladness clarity and next step is like the entire sensory activities to be quietened because senses go outward into the world into the sensations exploring the world they are to be withdrawn and turned inward so that the soul can ascend into the higher subtler dimensions of existence and explore those worlds and that is the approach of raja yoga so after purification and establishing posture the asana pranayama all that are done then there is the withdrawal into the inner state so that one can ascend so the ordinary activities of mind and sense must be entirely quieted in order that the soul may be free to ascend to higher states of consciousness and acquire the foundation for a perfect freedom and self mastery so to ascend and establish the foundation for a perfect freedom and self mastery but raja yoga does not forget that the disabilities of the ordinary mind proceed largely from its subjection to the reactions of the nervous system and the body so the disabilities of the ordinary mind from where does it come it comes largely by the subjection of the reactions of the nervous system and the body our nervous system it's very reactive for every sensory contact there is a reaction to the sensory contact this habitual reactivity on the top of it when it is compulsive that is what leads to disorder in the mental being so the disabilities of the ordinary mind proceed largely from its subjection to the reactions of the nervous system and the body so coming to a point of non reactivity is an essential condition samata equality is an essential condition to cure the mind and all its related disabilities it adopts therefore from the hatha yoga system its devices of asana and pranayama but reduces their multiple and elaborate forms in each case to one simplest and most directly effective process sufficient for its own immediate effect since raja yoga is not looking for physical siddhis it doesn't use 
all the elaborate asana, pranayama, kriyas, or oh, entire machinery. Therefore, sthiram sugam asana. That is, you, all that you need is a posture that gives you stable, restful poise, where you can stay in longer and longer duration for an inward plunge and an ascension into higher domains where your body is no more a barrier. It can be kept in perfect tranquility, restful stillness. That's all what is required. So there is no attempt to take up all the asanas and all the processes of pranayama, everything is not required. Only the bare minimum that is required so that the physical frame can be made still. It can stay in its posture, unmoved, immobile, stable, so that inner journey can take off. It adopts, therefore, from the Hatha Yogic system, its devices of asana and pranayama, but reduces their multiple and elaborate forms in each case to one simplest and most directly effective process, sufficient for its own immediate effect. Thus it gets rid, gets rid of the Hatha Yogi complexity and cumbersomeness, while it utilizes the swift and powerful efficiency, efficacy of its methods for the control of the body and the vital functions, and for the awakening of that internal dynamism full of a latent supernormal faculty typified, typified in yogic terminology by the Kundalini, the coiled, sleeping, serpent of energy within. So, Hatha Yoga is looking at perfecting the body. Here, the focus is on the subtle body. Yet, you need to ensure that the Sula Sarira gross body is made peaceful and for that it utilizes swift and powerful efficacy of its methods, methods of Hatha Yoga, but only some of it for control of the body and the vital function so that it can control the body, the nervous reactions and for the awakening of that internal dynamism. What is that internal dynamism? Dynamism full of a latent and supernormal faculty. It is latent. It is not activated. Like a seed, it is latent. It is The tree is latent in a seed. So the Kundalini Shakti is latent. It is sleeping at the base of the spine, according to the yogic knowledge. Latent supernormal faculty typified in yogic terminology by the Kundalini the coiled and sleeping serpent of energy within. So Hatha Yoga, no, Raja Yoga is looking straight at awakening this energy, but without spending too much time and energy on perfecting the body. There is no attempt to perfect the body. If body can be stable, still, restful, healthy, that's enough. Then the inner journey begins and to awaken the Kundalini. This done, the system proceeds to the perfect quietening of the restless mind and its elevation to a higher plane through concentration of mental forces, force by the successive stages which leads to, lead to the utmost inner concentration of ingathered state of the consciousness which is called Samadhi. So we know in the eight limbs of Raja Yoga, there is this dharana, dhyana, samadhi. That is where we are heading. That is, that is the samadhi is the state in which you are one with that higher consciousness, established in that. That's the goal of Raja Yoga, to establish in that. In order to do that, the body has to be made still, fit and it is not an obstacle. So 
the system once the body is in that condition its system the proceeds to the perfect quietening of the restless mind so first is bringing the stillness in the body then stillness in the nervous currents and reactivity then bringing stillness into the mind so all three layers are brought to stillness everything is in a peaceful inner repose so fr from there it's re it's elevation to a higher plane through concentration this is where the mind is elevated through concentration dharana practice of mental force by successive stages successive stages are dharana dhyana samadhi by which which lead to at most inner concentration or in gathered state of consciousness which is called samadhi so all the outgoing senses are drawn in word and plunged in word everything is tranquilized in that condition there is an ascension to the higher levels so this requires tremendous concentration so concentration eventually leads to samadhi a state of oneness establishing in that higher deeper consciousness so that's the process of raja yoga where it uses bare minimum of the hatha yogic practices and it moves to the subtle body and in the subtle body it's it is reaching to the highest in a samadhi in a state of samadhi that about the raja yoga by samadhi in which the mind acquires the capacity of withdrawing from its limited waking activities into freer and higher states of consciousness raja yoga serves a double purpose so there is our wakeful state we live in our normal wakeful state but when we sleep there is a dream state which we cannot access during the wakeful state so in raja yoga when you are going inward you are entering into those levels of consciousness which we otherwise can access only during sleep during dream state and even beyond dream state into dreamless state so there are various gradations of inward inner states so in ancient india these were classified as jagrat swapna sushupti turiya jagrat is our normal wakeful state swapna is the dream state sushupti is the deep state turiya is the fourth deepest state so in uh, samadhi it enables the yogin to go inward from the wakeful state into this deeper depths so that's the purpose served by the process it it compasses a compasses a pure mental action liberated from the confusion of the outer consciousness and passes thence to the higher supra mental planes on which the individual soul enters into its true spiritual existence so that's one purpose that is it can withdraw from these things liberate from the confused external activities and pass into higher supra mental planes planes of consciousness that is beyond mind and uh, here we need to be careful here uh, there is a plane of consciousness sri arbindo refers to as a super mind supra mental here the word he is using supra mental with hyphen is just referring to the ranges that is beyond mind there are many planes beyond mind so it's a generic reference not to the specific super mind passes then to a higher supra mental planes on which the individual soul enters into its true spiritual existence so there is the true spiritual existence where there is eternity timeless existence into which the individual soul can enter and dwell so that is the first purpose getting out of this confused external activities 
into that highest height, timeless existence of the spiritual life. The next is, but also it acquires the capacity of that free and concentrated energizing of consciousness on its object, which our philosophy asserts as the primary cosmic energy and the method of divine action upon the world. So one is going inward and ascending into higher consciousness, establishing in that. The other is turning back into the world with that concentrated energy and acting upon the world. That concentrated energizing of consciousness, the tapas, concentrated energizing, gathering of all the energy of consciousness on its object, which our philosophy asserts as the primary cosmic energy and the method of divine action in the world. There is divine existence above, beyond time and space, but that has its power and its energy, which acts in the world, run the universe, every little movement in it, from the tiniest particle to the largest galaxies. The whole cosmos is run by this energy that is the master of it. It is developing it and guiding the development. So what Raja Yoga potentially can give, one is ascension, the other is coming back of into that concentrated energizing of the consciousness on its object. What is that object? Which our philosophy asserts as the primary cosmic energy. There's a cosmic energy and the method of divine action upon the world. So that possibility is there for a cosmic divine action in the world. But for that, the primary cosmic energy is required. Oneness with that energy is required. By this capacity, the yogin, already possessed of the highest supracosmic knowledge and experience in the state of trance, is able in the waking state to acquire directly whatever knowledge and exercise whatever mastery may be useful or necessary to his activities in the objective world. So, this capacity, by this capacity, the yogin, by this capacity, is the concentration and mastery over the cosmic energy. Yogin, already possessed of the highest supracosmic knowledge and experience. So, as you ascend into that higher states, you have the corresponding knowledge and consciousness and experience. To the highest supracosmic knowledge and experience in the state of trance. So you access it in the state of trance when the body is still and you're withdrawing inward and ascending and accessing that supracosmic level and mastering that energy at that level. Then it is to be brought into the waking state. It's able in the waking state to acquire directly whatever knowledge and exercise, whatever mastery may be useful or necessary to his activities in the objective world. So to come back to the world and engage in the world, whatsoever be your activities, you will be or must be able to bring that into the waking state. If one is not able to bring it into the waking state, you can only have the higher states in the trance. There is no way you can bring it into the action, into the world. So, these are two different aspects. One is entering into samadhi in a trance state and accessing higher states. Other is bringing this into the waking state and apply that for acquisition of knowledge, or whatever kind of action that is to be done in the world. That's a different second aspect. So by this capacity, the yogin already possessed of the highest supracosmic 
knowledge and experience in the state of trance is able in the waking state to acquire directly whatever knowledge and exercise whatever mastery may be useful or necessary to his activities in the objective world. For the ancient system of Raja Yoga aimed not only Swarajya, the self-rule or subjective empire, the entire control of the subjective consciousness in all the states of activities proper to its own domain, but included Samrajya as well, outward empire, the control of the subjective consciousness of its outer activities and environment. So here we have the two Sanskrit words, Swarajya and Samrajya. Remember, historically, Raja Yoga emerged at a period where kings were expected to be yogins. To run an empire, you need yogic consciousness. So there are teaching of the kings we can find in the Upanishadic period. King Janaka, who was a great realized soul, who is also Raja Rishi. And therefore, the yoga was also perhaps referred to as a Raja Yoga, where you have first Swarajya. Swarajya is your inner subjective empire mastering the inner subjective empire. Only upon that mastery comes Samrajya. Samrajya means your outer empire. So the large kingdoms were called Samrajya of a king. So mastering your kingdom and bringing prosperity into the kingdom depends upon Swarajya, the mastery of the inner kingdom. That was the ancient science. There was no separation. It is much later Raja Yoga got specialized into only acquiring the Sam Swarajya, the inner kingdom, and less and less on the Samrajya. Originally, it was this right balance between Swarajya and Samrajya, the outer kingdom and the inner kingdom. But the inner kingdom is the condition, mastery of the inner kingdom is the condition for the mastery over the outer kingdom. The ancient system of Raja Yoga aimed not only at Swarajya, self-rule or subjective empire, the entire control by subjective consciousness of all the states and activities proper to its domain but included Samrajya as well, outward empire, the control by the subjective consciousness of its outer activities and environment. Very, very important point. So, originally for the Raja Yoga, it was not withdrawal from life, but Swarajya was the condition for Samrajya. Mastering the inner was the condition for mastering the outer. So here is something that is critically important for us to remember. Swarajya and Samrajya. Inner kingdom, outer kingdom. We perceive that as Hatha Yoga, dealing with the life and body, aims at the supranormal perfection of the physical life and its capacities and goes beyond it into the domain of mental life. So, Raja Yoga, operating with the mind, aims at a su supernormal perfection and enlargement of the capacities of mental life and goes beyond it into the domain of the spiritual existence. So he is again comparing the two. So in Hatha Yoga, there is first dealing with the life and body, mastering it. It is upon that foundation, it can proceed to go beyond it to master the mental life. So that's the first part of it. We perceive that as Hatha Yoga, Dealing with the body, life and body aims at 
super normal perfection of the physical life and its capacities and goes beyond into the domain of the mental life. So, Raja Yoga, operating with the mind, it starts, it, the mind is its uh, ground where it starts, aims at super normal perfection and, and enlargement of the capacities of the mental life. So that's the first thing. Developing the super normal capacities of the mental life. That is the first ground. Then goes beyond it into the domain of the spiritual existence. That which is beyond time and space. The timeless beauty, timeless existence. Beyond death, beyond birth, eternal. That is sought after. But the weakness of the system lie in its excessive reliance on abnormal states of trance. So on, he has explained the full scope of Raja Yoga. Now he is coming to the weakness. Just like he brought in the scope of Raja Yoga, then touched upon its weakness. Now he is coming to the weakness of Raja Yoga. Where does it limit you? And that limitation is an excessive reliance on the state of trance. Now, the moment we talk about spiritual man, spiritual state, spiritual life, the imagery that is popularly brought to mind is someone sitting in lotus posture, in meditation, in inner trance state, with closed eyes. We don't imagine someone sitting on a horse, embracing life, the abundance of life, sitting as a king on a throne or a CEO running an empire. This is, these are not the images that come to our mind when we talk about spiritual life. It is of a tranquil, inwardized, trance state. The weakness of the system lies in its excessive reliance on abnormal states of trance. This limitation leads first to a certain aloofness from the physical life. So that's the first limitation. We become cut off. There is a certain aloofness from the physical life. There is a material world. There is a physical life there, a thriving physical life. We have to step out of it into an aloofness. That's the first limitation. A certain aloofness from the physical life, which is our foundation and the sphere into which we have to bring our mental and spiritual gains. Whatever be our inner mental and spiritual gains, we have to bring it into this physical activities, physical sphere of life. So there is a tendency of aloofness because of the dependency on trance state to access higher states of consciousness. Especially is the spiritual life in the system too much associated with the state of samadhi. So someone who is lost in samadhi, that is the idea of spiritual life. And a glorification of that trance-bound condition not the active plunge into life, active mastery of the physical world and its challenges. That is not, unfortunately, seen because of the reliance on the trance state as a way to access the higher consciousness. There is this cutting off and aloofness. Even accessing of the spiritual state is possible in that trance state. So especially is the spiritual life in this system too much associated with the state of Samadhi. Our object is to make spiritual life and its experiences fully active and fully utilizable in waking state and even in the normal use of the functions. For us, it is critically important to bring that state into wakeful state and bodily life and action in the world. But 
In Raja Yoga, it tends to withdraw into a subliminal plane at the back of our normal experiences instead of descending and possessing our whole existence. So, this is something that happened down the line. Originally, it was, as we can see from the very name, even to be a king, it's not like Raja Yoga is not only as seen as a path that is just superior to all other paths, but also a path for the kings to be a king. Samrajya and the foundation of Sarajya. But down the line, what happened in India was loss of this original integral view and it became increasingly only Swarajya, where trans condition became the method to access the spiritual and individual liberation got glorified and renunciation of the kingdom and the responsibility of the king became the trend, the fashion. So, as a result, the whole yogic practice eventually turned and became otherworldly. And trans state became the most glorified condition where you are accessing that higher state of consciousness. But you cannot bring it into wakeful state, into action, into the world affairs and manage the world like a Raja Rishi, a sage king would do. So that possibility was lost because of this excessive reliance on the trance state. And that is a fundamental limitation of Raja Yoga as it got transmitted to us in the modern contemporary world. We must remember it was not so in the very, very ancient India in its original conceptions of the Raja Yoga. So, the point to remember is we are exploring all this in order to understand, first of all, the strengths and weaknesses of each school of yoga. And also, in the context of we are looking at an integral yoga, a yoga that embraces life, transforms life. So we are looking at each yoga, its point of contact with the divine consciousness, its method of divine, method of accessing that consciousness and the limitations of those each approach and strength of each approach and which part it is utilizing. Hatha yoga uses gross body, Raja yoga uses the subtle body and both has its limitations. So with that, let's end today's episode. Thank you for your loving attention. Please give me your feedback and please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and tell me what are the ways I can improve this podcast. See you next week. Thank you.